go into our broker roundtable segment of the program. I know many of you have been to, uh, we're at CCIM last week. Um, hopefully this is some new information for you. I'd appreciate it if you can stick around and uh, hear what these uh, experts have to say. Uh, first, we're going to start with land. Uh, Ginger Knup has been analyzing the Tucson housing market since 2000 and has been the sole operator of Bright Future since 2012. She collects extensive data on the Tucson housing market and specializes in analyzing this data and making it useful to industry decision makers. Ginger holds a bachelor's degree from Michigan State University and has been a licensed real estate broker since 1999. Ginger? Thank you, Michael. Put that here because I talk with my hands, even for just five minutes. All right, we currently have a finished lot inventory of about 2,700 lots. That's non-age restricted active lots. That's my count, 2,700. Um, last, <coughs> under construction, we've got 2,600. So we have basically a year supply active. We've got another <coughs> 10 month supply because we're going to assume absor absorption is going to speed up a little. Another 10 month supply under construction. Beyond that, I look at what, what subdivisions, how many lots are, are in play, where developers or builders are actively working to bring them to market. That's another 3,700 lots. Those are for delivery in 2020, okay? So that's where we're at with our inventories. I don't look at the inventories of the active adult market. I look at more trends because Robeson has thousands of acres. They just keep flatting. So it's meaningless to talk about active adult, active adult lots. Um, however, the trends there, the important things to remark with the active adult market would be that Del Webb at Rancho Del Lago is going to close out this year, which m is relevant because there will be no active adult product on the east side. It will then be concentrated in Green Valley, Sarita, and then up northwest in Dove Mountain. Um, and Meritage has brought their 66 finish lots at the south end of Canoa Ranch to market. So that is indicative of a stronger market. They've been sitting on those lots for 10 years, and so they, they've pulled their initial permits there. So that's all I'm going to say about the active adult market. Um, more importantly, when we talk about the finished lot inventory, we have to look at the composition of it because that is indicative of where pricing is headed. So right now, the 2,700 lots, 16% of those are lots that the builder purchased as just plat and engineered lots and then had to finish. 19% of those lots were purchased as finished lots, so they've been sitting around. Okay, so those lots have incurred some costs in the last cycle. Our bigger concern as we look forward is that 65% of the current inventory is a newly developed land. Okay, so that's, that's indicative of higher, higher prices and is pushing higher prices because that is all newly developed land. One year ago, that 65% was 50%. Okay, so we are absorbing that inventory and moving ahead and it's affecting pricing. We see that in recent transactions, I looked back just a few months since you met here at the beginning of November, so I looked back through you know, October, a few significant transactions that I think illustrate where we're headed with pricing. Um, DR Horton paid $925 a front foot for 40 wide lots, 53 lots, west of Star Valley, finished lot price, okay? West of Star Valley, 925 front foot. Um, the cheapest lots are now gone. They were platted lots down by Drexel and Alvernon, 143 lots that LGI picked up for $15,000 at P&E. Okay, so that's, that's as about as cheap as you can pick up a P&E lot <coughs> these days. Um, conversely, up at Hardy and Thornydale, DR Horton picked up P&E lots for $37,750. 35750 a lot. So 36000 for a peony lot in the northwest versus 15000 for a peony lot south of I-10 in that south submarket. Um, when we look at the master plans, the two recent significant transactions would be at Rancho Cerrito, where they were at 1150 for 71 lots, again, 40 wides. And <coughs> at La Estancia, Lenar picked up um, 112 lots that were 50 wides for 1,100 a foot. So in your master plans, you get finished lot prices are 11, 
1,000 to 1,200 of front foot. Uh, those, master, <coughs> that, those master plan prices are also reflected in, uh, you know, not just Gladden Farms, but S Santa Rita Ranch 3 down s in the south submarket. We see those where more improvements are going in. So all that to say, our median house price is going to go over $300,000 in the coming few months. And the escalating pressure from land costs and land development costs coming from labor shortages and pressure on the labor market are pushing those prices up at the land level. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ginger. Uh, next up, uh, we're going to discuss the office market. Rick Kleiner is a shareholder of Cushman Wakefield uh, PICOR and specializes in the sale, leasing, investment of office and medical properties. Rick is distinguished by his extensive sales background and related education, including his MBA from the University of Arizona. Rick has been PICOR's top office division producer for the past 10 consecutive years and amongst the company's top annual producers six times since 2010. Rick? Thanks, Michael. Nice to be with you all this morning. On your tables, um, and also these are available on our website, is our uh, market beat. Um, and so at www.pycor, you can always go and download uh, market beat for all of the different divisions that we represent. So I've got four takeaways and a bonus. Um, following on the comments throughout the whole morning, I would say relative to the office market, that the direction is positive, almost to the point where you could say there's momentum of a very positive nature. As you see, the, quarter, the fourth quarter vacancy was below 10%, somewhere in the mid, about 9.4%, and that's the lowest since the Great Recession. So that's really terrific uh, progress. As you, as you look further and on the back side of our uh, market beat, there's a lot of statistics but relative to lease rates, it breaks pretty dramatically between the type of office properties. So class A, class B plus, you're seeing full service lease rates in the $24 range and, and higher, frankly. We're seeing some full service lease rates at some of the uh, higher class properties presently moving towards the upper 20s a square foot, which we've not seen for a decade or longer. However, the class B, C properties continue to be under, uh, uh, underutilized and, and there's really uh, an opportunity there for people to evaluate how those could be repositioned or scraped and, and rebuilt. Regarding new development, um, owner users from an office perspective, the, the condo craze that we saw in the early 2000s. We're getting a little bit of a heartbeat, not much. Um, the uh, sub-market, the, the uh, specialty of uh, medical is, is, continues to be very strong. Um, and so I think that probably during the next year you'll see some uh, new construction, new development of, of medical that'll be quite dramatic. And uh, following on the discussion we've had about uh, speculative office construction. We're not quite there yet in a, in a broad sense because the lease rates don't support the cost of new construction. Uh, that said, there is the dramatic example of 75 Broadway uh, and J.E. Dunn uh, and that, that type of absorption that, that might be forecast for downtown would change, um, change the market entirely because the lease rates that would be necessary for that type of, of building would be uh, well above anything we've seen or experienced. Finally, investment sales. Uh, they are occurring. Cap rates, I would say, typically are going to be in the 7% range. We might see some lower for really uh, outstanding triple net leased buildings. But the, uh, the type of investment properties offered in Tucson are you know, somewhat limited, uh, but perhaps we'll see more as there continues to be more money coming from other uh, communities. Uh, uh, looking for opportunities in Tucson. Finally, I promised you a bonus on the, uh, on the back, lower, lower uh, corner of this page, is our new address. We've moved to 5151 East Broadway. We're thrilled with it. For, we, we will have an open house sometime later in the year. 
Uh, but if you're in the neighborhood, we're right at the corner of Broadway and Rosemont, and please drop in. It's just a really cool office. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Next up is multifamily. Art Wadlin is a senior managing director at Burcadia. Art's history prior to the sale merger with Burcadia in December 2012 began with Hendrix and Partners, whereas he was one of the founding partners. Art is focused 100% on multifamily advisory and brokerage service. As a real estate broker in Tucson for over 30 years, Art has sold well over three billion, with a B, of multifamily properties. He has successfully, has successfully holds the position of all-time Tucson apartment sales leader, selling both more volume and units than other brokerage firms. Art? Uh, as Paul Kraft said, uh, things are pretty rosy in the, in the multifamily business. Uh, multifamily from about any uh, different aspect. Uh, and the reason for that is, is pretty easy, it's, it's jobs. Multifamily is 100% about jobs, and um, as jobs go, so goes multifamily. So Tucson is um, about uh, four or five years behind the rest of the country in multifamily, um, both growth, rent growth, um, and just all the economics uh, regarding multifamily. Um, Actually, uh, Dr. Hammond was at the Tucson Economic Forecast was speaking about jobs, and I'm, I get asked from people nationally about, well, what's the story with jobs in Tucson? You know, you showed that there's 0.7% job growth, 0.9% job growth, and some pretty anemic numbers that they get from Reese and other uh, places. So I'm told that the, uh, the revised numbers are gonna come out sometime this month, and hopefully they come out and we see it's in the 2% range, or at least one, one over one and a half, something like that. But I can tell you the jobs seem to be here. It just hasn't shown up yet. So I think the easiest way to look at what's happened in Tucson recently is just looking at the stats. Uh, Tucson is, was number three, believe it or not, in 2017 for uh, income growth, uh, rent growth, excuse me, rent growth, 5.5%. Uh, uh, Sacramento was number one at 6.5%, so we're just 1% behind the national leader. Uh, as a little bit of a point of reference, uh, Portland grew 10%, over 10% in 2015. Some other communities grew over 10%. So 5.5% uh, is good, but it's, it's nowhere near the ceiling. Uh, question, can rents go higher? Um, I know Gabby at, uh, at the Star and some of her cohorts uh, actually called me last week. I think they're working on an article. Uh, they've got some calls from people that are complaining that their rents are going up too much. And uh, I told her, or told her, co her um, other person working on it, that it doesn't quite work that way. Uh, you know, if Jim Click decided he's going to raise all his car prices by $2,000, they're going to go buy at Homes Total. And it's the same thing in multifamily. There's a lot of options out there. That being said, Tucson rents can go higher. Uh, and I shouldn't say it this way, but, but they should in a way just to keep up with other, other communities. So Tucson rents right now are 17% of median income. So of median income, 17% of it goes for rents in Tucson. The national average is in the mid-20s. Uh, places like LA, it's over 40%. Uh, Phoenix, Albuquerque, El Paso, Salt Lake City, Colorado Springs, Denver, all those communities are close to 20% or higher. So yeah, there's some room for growth. Um, how about new development? Uh, Tucson is second from the bottom nationally uh, for the n number of units under development as compared to the inventory of units. It's less than 1%, and this is on market rate units. So if you add in student housing and affordable, uh, the number's higher, but it's less than 1%. Uh, 2018, we're gonna see a few more starts. 2019, probably even more percentage-wise. There's four or five deals that I've heard about that, that may get started. but. Uh, I think rents, there's a lot of room for rents to go and there's not a lot of construction. Uh, lastly, sales. Last year was about half a billion of sales multifamily in Tucson. Uh, I believe that's a record uh, in 2006 or seven, I think it was about 450. 2015 and 16 was about 400 million. Uh, cap rates, uh, I think I heard 7% somewhere. I not know what that means. It's, uh, our cap rates are all sub six, mid fives, maybe even low fives. That goes for all product types. Maybe C's are closer to six, but um, it's definitely sub six cap market right now. And uh, hopefully interest rates don't go up too far too fast and uh, that'll stay the same. 
Thanks. Since nobody else volunteered to do retail, uh, you get to hear from me, Michael Latch, CBRE. Um, so if anybody's been paying attention to the national press, they've undoubtedly come across this phrase, the retail apocalypse, which is a, a way to sensationalize the idea that e-commerce is just destroying the brick and mortar retail industry. Um, that's not entirely accurate. Um, I prefer this quote from Jeffrey Gren uh, Jeanette, the president and CEO of Macy's Inc. that reads, these are challenging times for retail. These changes we are seeing are secular and not secular. So the key there is it's changing. It's not gloom and doom, brick and mortar retail is gonna be totally destroyed by Amazon, it's changing. So let's take a look at some, some key facts that show that this retail apocalypse may not be right on our doorstep. Holiday sales were 658.3 billion, the largest year-over-year -year increase since Q Q1 2012. Total retail and food sales rose 5.5% in Q4. That's up from 3.6% in 2006. So Q4 2007, better than 2006. The 2000 out retail outlook is positive. Uh, there's positive consumer sentiment. Uh, there's benefits of the recently enacted tax reform that are starting to work their way into consumers' uh, pockets, and they're, more, they're less cautious, which for retailers means maybe they can start backing off some of these uh, huge deep discounts that they're offering just to generate traffic. And I'm kind of nervous because Reed with DDR is staring at me as I'm giving this, so. Uh, <laughs> all right. Nationally, net absorb absorption and net asking rents were up in 2017. Doesn't sound like a retail apocalypse to me. 17, uh, 2017 e-commerce sales as a percentage of total retail sales was 8.9%. That's up from 8%. Think about that. Of total retail sales, e-commerce still only was 8.9%. And part of that increase from the prior year is retailers, uh, brick and mortar retailers investing in their e-commerce platforms. Think, for example, Walmart buying jet.com. Now, there are winners and losers. Um, obviously, we've had bankruptcies and distress, uh, distress credit. Examples are Toys R Us, Payless Shoe Source, Vitamin World, Rue 21, et cetera. I would argue that those are retailers that didn't adapt. Uh, which retailers are going to survive? It's going to be those that integrate um, their omni-channel initiatives, including mobile. Consumers are demanding more and more what they want, when they want it, where they want it, and the retailers that can provide that are going to survive. Uh, you need to deliver the best in-store experience, and that means integrating your technology platform with your brick and mortar in-store experience with um, excellent personalized support along the way throughout the channel. Uh, Right-sizing the physical footprints of stores. Uh, retailers can use technology to, to understand their foot traffic patterns and sales data and um, perhaps decrease the size of their existing stores. Uh, this obviously would reduce rent for them and potentially help the bottom line. Um, closing underperforming stores uh, and investing more in technology and remodels. Closing a store isn't necessarily a sign of a failure as long as it's part of a long-term strategy moving forward. So what should landlords do? They need to adapt and be creative. They need to understand that the world is changing. Um, they need to monetize underutilized space. An example of this might be taking a look at your parking field and if you're over park, potentially selling some pads and, and generating income that way or ground leasing those pads. Rethinking the tenant mix, as, as I'm sure you've seen around town, it's not just traditional retailers occupying retail space anymore. It's call centers, it's office users, it's medical, entertainment. Um, that's a trend that's gonna consider, or continue. And landlords need to consider actions or actions that are gonna drive traffic. Uh, examples would be short-term leases, pop-up stores, et cetera. I think going forward, retail, brick and mortar retail will survive. I do think at malls, you're gonna see a lot less traditional retail and more of these other type uses like entertainment, office, and, and even residential in some instances. So I don't think uh, there's a retail apocalypse. I think people that are gonna adapt, recognize that things are changing, uh, have a good chance of surviving. Thank you.